The way I know this piece originally is as a trumpet player. That's how. Oh, that's okay. my introduction to this piece because this piece, along with Mahler Five, are the two most famous pieces that start with a solo trumpet. I have not conducted pictures in many, many years. As a matter of fact, this is. I'm actually breaking a personal vow because I had decided almost two decades ago to never conduct pictures at an exhibition again. And it's because of my pianistic bias. I, 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 I was struggling with trying to make the orchestral version more pianistic. Now, as I'm older, hopefully wiser, and now is a great time for me to come back to the Ravel orchestration of pictures and, and try and make sense of it for myself. Try and, try and marry the two ideas of this or great pianistic work and yet this great orchestration of the piece. In the waning decades of the 19th century, there was a movement afoot in Russia, as there was in many other European countries, to emphasize that country's folk roots and traditions in the arts. Musicians, writers, composers, painters, they banded together, and the results, in many cases, were masterpieces. Friendships were also forged, and one of them was the bond between composer Modest Vazorgsky and the architect and painter Victor Hartmann. When Hartmann died in 1873 of a brain aneurysm at only 39 years old, Mazorsky was heartbroken. The following year, the St. Petersburg Academy of Fine Arts presented an exhibition of some 400 works by Hartmann as a tribute to him. It was that exhibition which inspired Mazorsky to write a work in honor of his friend. The piece has come to be known in English as Pictures at an Exhibition. All due respect to the greatest orchestrator who has ever lived, as far as I'm concerned, Maurice Ravel. I actually much prefer the piano version. From my perspective, the piano version actually leaves more to the imagination than the orchestral version does. Uh, it, it's also much easier, in, in a way, to perform in, in, in that. You get to perform it, you know everything that's going on, yada, yada, yada. As, as soon as you incorporate more people in the orchestral version, it, it becomes that much more difficult to, you know, to, to make things happen. That having been said, when it's under the auspices of an orchestrator like Maurice Ravel, the colors he gets out of the orchestra in, especially in this particular piece of style. Because it's so, yeah, like you have to give him so much credit for the success of the piece. And and all the other versions of it are much closer to the original Mazorsky than his. He took the most liberties, I think, with, with his orchestration of it. And I think probably because he was a master composer too. And so we, can, we give him a buy, I think, because it's like, of course, well, it's Ravel, he knows what he's doing. It's also important to remember that Ravel wrote many of his most famous and magnificent orchestral scores for piano first, and only orchestrated them later. His thing, like if you look at some of his piano pieces and then you look at how he orchestrated his own music, it's amazing how much he doesn't, how much he drops from the piano and he puts into the orchestra and all that kind of stuff. Because I did that, I took a couple of the piano pieces and didn't look at the orchestra first, I didn't know that well. He said, well what did I do if I was Ravel? And that would be stressing over all these, you know, this crazy piano stuff and trying to orchestrate. And then you go look at it, and the strings would just be going, you know, I'm like okay. You know, so it was, a, it was a good lesson to learn. So he he is a master of taking piano music and orchestrating. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is part of the struggle that that I have because I'm always trying to, personally, I'm always trying to get in the mind of the composer. I want to hear what said composer had in mind when he, she, or it wrote any particular piece of music. Yet that having been said though, we, this was the beginning of the machine age, and this was the beginning of the 
of both the, the birth and the death of the greater society coming out of World War I, the, the, the incredibly dramatic changes that that wrought on a sociological level. And what that, what that means is that we no longer have this, this kind of monolithic concept of, of what a piece of art can be. But that, uh, these reimaginings now are, are works of art in, the, in their own right. And I think they should be looked at in that way. So it's not necessarily Mussorgsky's pictures at an exhibition anymore. If, if you're going to do it at the orchestra, you're going to do it in that version, you have to understand that Ravel brought his particular lens to this project and you are seeing it through that lens. that is French within those pieces. I mean, at that time, you're talking about Paris, and you're talking about the epicenter of classical music. And there, there, was, there was so much cross-pollinization going on, it could not have remained a strictly Russian piece under the hands of someone like Marcus Ravel. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>